All right, everyone, it's two o'clock. We still got some folks trickling in, but I'm gonna ask all of my panelists uh, to turn on their cameras and uh, unmute and let's do a little sound and video test. Julie, we're still not able to join the video like last time it says that the host has a disabled. Uh, goodness, all right, hold on. <laughs> Technology, man. <clears throat> Let's see. <coughs> ah, I think it's down there. Hold on. There we go. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> nice. I just wanted to keep everybody in suspense. <laughs> oh. Nice clothes today, there, John. Nice what? I said I shaved today to look clean cut. Oh, yeah, yeah look at you. You got I did not. Serious beard going there. I like it. It's all almost all gray, Mike. That's the problem. It happens. All right. So we've got some attendees in here with some questions. So now is a good time to cover this part. So everybody, you've got a little chat window in the bottom of your screen. And so you should be able to ask any questions there. Be sure that you're not asking privately to a person. There's a little drop down that says to panelists and all attendees. For all that are attending, that's how we'll be addressing all of the questions today. You're going to be muted just because it is going to be uh, or there are going to be several people on the call today and just for control and, and making sure that we can get to all of our questions. We're just going to handle everything through the chat window. Uh, Carolyn, you said I cannot be on video. That's totally okay. I've just got the panelists on video today, so you don't even have to join on video. Let's see. Got some more folks hopping on. All right. Well, while we're waiting for more people to hop on, I'll just go ahead. And let's let's start with introductions. Uh, my name is Julie Jones. I lead appraiser outreach and engagement here at Class Valuation. I am joined by three of my colleagues, uh, and I'll start with them, and I'll go around as I see them in my video. Uh, John Dingman, you're up. Hi, I'm the chief appraiser here at Class Valuation. I'm also a certified residential appraiser. My daughter is becoming a trainee, believe it or not. My wife is an appraiser, so it seems like it's just going to be a family thing, um, which it is for many of you, too. So thanks for joining didn't you warn her about becoming an appraiser, John? <laughs> I love it. So I, you know, I do too. <laughs> I'm, I'm encouraging her to seek out a, a, a sales license at the same time, which she's going to do. But, um, you know, that's a good combination, I think. She knows that the profession has been good to her mom and dad, and as a result, her. And, and so, makes sense. But so next up, I've got Cindy Harris. Cindy, can you hear us? I can. I am the Senior Vice President of Innovation. I've been a certified appraiser for 27 years. I too am married to an appraiser. Um, and we're really excited to have you all here today. Thanks for joining, Cindy. And then last on the class side, I've got Nick Butterfield. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am not an appraiser, nor am I married to one, um, <laughs> but I, I am the marketing director here at CLASS, um, and I'm excited to hear everybody's thoughts today and uh, excited to, to figure out what we can do to, to help you all out moving forward here. Thanks, Nick. And so our panel of experts, and so just so you guys know kind of what the layout is of the class at council. So everybody that's on the council was kind of randomly selected just based off past experience, um, commentary uh, that they provided in the past. And so we reached out to a select group and Mark, I'm gonna mute you real quick. Got him muted. Um, so we reached out to those panelists and ask them to join and we'll rotate this every quarter. This is going to be a quarterly council where we're going to tackle all of uh, the issues that are affecting you as an appraiser and see how uh, we can improve things on the class side. And so I've got a few panelists here and I'm going to, I'm going to go around as I see them on the screen. Uh, so Kathy, let's start with you on the road, like a good appraiser should be. Okay. But I'm um, picking up the data. I'm kind of, I mix business and pleasure all the time just the way that it is 
And Kathy, share with the group where, where you're located. I'm in Hollywood, Florida. I've been appraising for 21 years. Um, I like it. It's just something enjoyable. I got into it by accident, but I think it's an awesome thing. Thanks for being here today. No All right, Pete. Well, good morning, actually good afternoon now. Uh, I'm Pete Fontana. I'm a certified residential appraiser. I live in Great Falls, Montana. I'm also the uh, chair of the Montana Regulatory Board and I serve on the Board of Trustees for the Appraisal Foundation as well. And after uh, we're done talking about revisions, you're gonna sing us a song. We'll all gather around the campfire <laughs> and listen in. <laughs> uh, maybe. <laughs> all right, Mike. Uh, Mike McKernan, I'm a residential appraiser in Michigan. I've been doing it for 29 years. I actually used to be a mortgage loan processor and I saw those nice colorful appraisals come across the desk and seemed like such a joyful profession. <laughs> um, 29 years later, it still kept my interest. Awesome. Um, so I'm in the Michigan area. I used to actually work in class as well, so I kind of see things from both sides of the spectrum. We won't hold it against you, Mike. All right, Jeff, you're up. I am Jeff Hamrick. I uh, live in Sacramento area. I've been appraising for 20 years. Awesome. Thanks here. for joining us. Jocelyn? Hello, I'm Jocelyn. I'm in the Dallas, Texas area. Um, certified residential um, coming up on 20 years. Awesome. And Gillen, you're not sideways today for everybody else on, on the call on our dry run. His video was sideways. Gillen, thanks for joining us. Yeah, I managed to figure that out. Um, I'm actually uh, over in Utah. I did my training in Florida for about a year and a half, and then I've been doing it now for a year and a half in Utah. So I'm only three years in the business. Awesome. And then Josh. He's looking Hi, for that. Meeting. There he is. Sacramento area. I've been appraising for 17 years. I did uh, six years at uh, Liberty Home Equity as their chief supervisor, review appraiser, and uh, I still like it. I love, I love what I do. So, and then last but certainly not least, we have Mr. Mark Skapinitz. I had to un unmute myself since you muted me. <laughs> um, so I have been appraising now uh, as a certified residential appraiser in Atlanta, Georgia uh, for about 18 years now. I actually started my career in New Jersey and then uh, continued it down here. Awesome. Well, I think that's everybody on the panel. We're right on time. It's about 2.08. I had a lot of 10 minutes for intros. Um, so for everybody else that probably just joined, um, just to let you know, we're going to tackle uh, a few topics. I've got about 10 questions here that we prepared ahead of time based off of your questions and your feedback that came in um, or questions and feedback from the panelist group. We're gonna go through each question, get through as many as we can um, and give every panelist an opportunity uh, to speak on each topic. Um, if you have anything to add or you have any additional questions, please put them in that chat window. Um, when you send in your question, just make sure you're checking all panelists and attendees just so everybody can see it. Um, I do have all of the attendees muted and that's just because it is gonna be a larger call and uh, to control the meeting and make sure that we stay on topic uh, I've just got everybody muted uh, and your cameras are off as well. So hold on. Uh, Danny, you said you wouldn't want to see my mug anyway. I'm sure that's not true, Danny, but thank you for joining. Um, okay, so intros are, are out of the way. So let's just dive in, guys. Um, the first uh, question that I have or concern was around multiple revisions on an appraisal that were sent one by one rather than all at once. Um, so, you know, up to you guys who wants to start or who wants to chime in about the topic, but if you want to give uh, any experience that you have or, or any additional concerns or, or suggestions. Yeah, I've seen this one quite a bit and um, I normally see the, the first uh, revisions come back very quickly on something maybe very simple, easy to spot, um, like may, maybe something in the sketch that, that highlights and doesn't uh, correlate to page one. And so I don't know um, what level of um, process it goes through before it actually gets kicked back to the appraiser. And so I don't know if it maybe goes through two or three 
uh, sets of reviews before it goes back, or if it just goes back and the minute they find one, they send it back. And, and sometimes that's what I find. If I get multiple, normally the first are super simple that are, are maybe just very easy to, to correct. Yeah, and that's a good point. I'm going to take it over to, to John Dingman uh, really quick, just to explain a, a couple of different levels of review that goes on on the back end once an appraisal comes in. So when your reports are delivered, there is a QC process. We call it a quality control examination. Um, and I, I use that definition more than willing to share. The states uh, have specific requirements in their regulatory framework about what an AMC can and cannot do. Um, but your appraisals are being digested in two ways. If the lender is, uh, is asking for us to submit to the portals, UCDP and EAB, that's happening. And then it's being ingested by our platform called Class Intelligence, which is running rules against it, similar to most QC programs any lender uh, or AMC would be running uh, on your reports. It is using logic. Um, so things like it, it can do the math very quickly and tell you if your adjustments are going possibly in the wrong direction, things like that. The first step in the QC examination is really going to be for compliance, right? It's going to, it is to, Gillen's point, it's going to be things like check box isn't checked, this use path issue isn't addressed, um, the address isn't correct. There's, it's not an intensive review and it's not meant to be an appraisal review by any stretch. Um, I, I would be interested that we do have multiple teams. So when you send a, re, a revised report back as an appraiser, it goes to the revisions team and then they're checking to see if you address the concerns. Um, I would like to think that they're not then sending things back to you, but they may find something else. And I just assume push that to the underwriter. If we're talking about underwriter concerns, um, Josh Richardson is on, on the line, so he knows, but I have those conversations with our clients repeatedly. There are some uh, that do this more than others. And I warn them, um, try to, to, to come up with all of your underwriting questions at one point in time like going back and forth, like, well, this was addressed, cool. Now ask the appraiser this. It's very frustrating for an appraiser, I get it. So what I'm hearing, John, is we, we probably hold some of the blame on this side at class, but then some of it's also underwriters. And so that part is, is out of our control and, and we do our best. And I know that, that you uh, talk with our lenders all the time about how we can streamline that a little bit, but that, that's something that we're fighting on this side too. Um, any of our other panelists have some additional thoughts or, or experience that you've had? Uh, actually, I, I haven't had any issues with um, multiple revisions coming back. And I, I not with class itself, but I, I think from the appraiser's perspective, it's difficult because when you crack that report open again, even if it's just for a simple change in the report, you really have to look at the whole report again. Because I don't know about everybody's software, but sometimes with my Bradford technology, software, you know, spacing is different. And then when it gets converted, there's some issues. So I really have to look at that report from top to bottom, even if it's a minor revision. So multiple revisions, it's 20 minutes every time you're cracking that report open. So I, I empathize with, you know, with the appraiser getting that repeated, but I haven't had that experience with multiples, not with class. Well, and to that point, Mike, time is money. So every, every minute that you're spending on, on redoing something in the report, that's, that's money. Uh, Pete, you had something, I think. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that might help the, uh, the appraiser in the field uh, at least understand the multiple revisions, and that was one of, that was one of my questions uh, that, that I submitted to you, is if I understand, you know, I, I completely understand that once the report is delivered to the client, uh, the client might have questions uh, about the report. Um, and so to calm some of the frustrations, maybe in the class portal, they you can say that this is our QC review, but, but the second follow-up came from directly from the client and from the underwriter, which allevi will alleviate some of the frustration because a lot of the frustration that, that I hear is, why can't they review at one time? And I try to explain to these folks that actually this is a different person looking at the report now. And if it's the client, your client, class's client looking at that, um, it might be helpful that the notes come back and say that, you know, this QC request came from 
uh, our client. Uh, and so can you please address this, either as the underwriter or a reviewing appraiser with our client? And because then it might calm some of the frustration because it, the frustrating part is when you look at it, it's like if it goes through an automated process and it, like John said, and it checks all the boxes. And then once they send that back and then somebody physically touches the report inside a classes workshop there, maybe one of your review appraisers, and then it comes back. That's the frustrating part because it, it almost to me seems like if, if the report gets flagged for a, a, a QC uh, uh, issue and gets pushed back to the appraiser, maybe that should immediately go to the class reviewer. I'm not sure how that process works with you folks to say, well, it, it went through the automated review, but take a look at this because then we're going to send one request to the client or to the appraiser. So as I got this, I, I, this was told told me a couple of years ago from a, a an AMC chief appraiser that touching the report more than once costs the AMC money as well as the appraiser because the margins are so thin on the how much money you're making. And so trying to avoid multiple um, requests for revisions is 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 a time and money wasted on both sides, the appraiser and the AMC. So I like the, the one takeaway that I got from that, Pete, was that labeling where the revision or the stip is coming from, I think would be really helpful. Um, communication and transparency is always like for me, top of the list, and I know it is for the rest of our team at class. So I, I like that suggestion a lot. Um, cool. Any other commentary on that? Mark? So, I mean, and I've had this happen uh, with class, but also with others as well, is that, you know, you, you get the revision request from one reviewer. And then when it gets sent back in and you send it back, that report's now being reviewed by a different reviewer who now comes up with different things that they see as opposed to what the first person saw. So it's kind of like one person's on one page, one person's on another page. You know, so that frustrates me because it just feels like, hey, you know, what's going on here that the first person didn't see this, but now the second person wants this. It's kind of like they have different ideas of what should be called out as a revision uh, or a revision request. Um, I, I, along this lines, and I didn't see it within the questions that you were, you were looking at it, uh, that you sent um, or topics is, and I know this, I know the... Um, the portal uh, doesn't allow for this, but the thing that frustrates me is that I can't get to a reviewer directly when it's put into appraisal scope. It's, you know, I have to email back, you know, hey, this has been done, this has been done, or, or, or hey, what are you looking at? And then I have to wait for that email to be read by that reviewer or be sent to that reviewer. So for me, some, a, a solution somehow, I know appraisal scope doesn't do it, but would to be maybe if the reviewer actually sent an email out directly to me as well so that I could respond back to them with what I've done and, and how I've done things. I like that suggestion a lot. Can I, can I interject something real quick on that? Um, yeah. If I have a revision that doesn't make sense, I'll just pick up a phone and call class and ask to be sent over to the review department. And usually I can get somebody on the phone in a few minutes yeah. and talk through it. Most times you're going to need to put something in the report anyway. So I don't know if an email is the best way to remedy that or maybe just picking up the phone and calling during work hours, which I know most of us are working late in the evening anyways. But the other part was with the differentiation between client review and QC reviews, when you get the email of the review request, doesn't it specify in there that this review request won't impact your tier rating because it's from our client? Isn't there language already in there specifying where that review is coming from? Yes, I've experienced it. It clearly says this will not impact your score with us and it's coming from so-and-so. That's so it's clear that it's coming from the lender, yes. So they, they do kind of split that off already that you know it's coming from a secondary lender and not from the QC line, at least in my experience. Final thoughts on that topic before I move on. I want to keep us on our timeline here. We got one minute. Anything else? Okay, good. Uh, let's see. Unwarranted revision requests. And I've got a couple of bullets under this. Um, revision requests for items already addressed in the appraisal report. Most likely it's going to be in your addenda. 
Um, and then concerns that it counts against you on the scorecard and how we can remedy that. So I'll take any uh, feedback from the team on, uh, on that topic. From Cindy or I? Anybody. No. Uh, un unwarranted revision requests can be very, very frustrating, particularly if you've already taken the time to articulate your position and, and give, it, give your opinion. Um, we're not perfect. Uh, the team's not perfect. Uh, sometimes we miss things. That's unfortunate. I do, I do know the team does a very good job of creating word search items and going back to Pete's earlier comment, there is a manual process with the, the automated 100% of the time, but they'll do word searches through your report. Sometimes they're being too restrictive with the word search on the spelling. And so if you have a misspelling where they do, they're not finding it. Um, that can be frustrating. And again, those are coaching opportunities for our team. Um, and then Cindy knows more about how it affects sort of the, the scorecards, but um, that's my comments on unwarranted conditions. Yeah. Hey, can I make a I would say on the scorecard? Go ahead, Cindy, Go ahead, and then Josh, Josh I'm gonna come back to you. I, I was just going to say on the, on the scorecard, we definitely know we have some room for improvement there in our class intelligence um, system is going to help us in the very near future to establish a much better scorecarding system, which will be, you know, fed back into the assignment logic, et cetera, but it will be more transparent for you and you won't have to worry about calling in on something that wasn't warranted to have it, you know, removed from your score, et cetera. So we are definitely working towards improving that and completely un understand where, where you're coming from there. Josh? Yeah, and, and that was to, to that point, I, the, the scorecards contribute to PTSD and no offense to anybody who actually has PTSD, but it really stresses me out when I get a scorecard and you see this list and I just glance at it and I'm going like, I know I wasn't late on any of my appraisals. It'd be nice if at the bottom of the scorecard, you could have a resolution. You're doing great. Your status as a preferred appraiser is not impacted. Carry on, soldier. Something along <laughs> those lines, because it, it just leaves it hanging. And then you don't know whether you have to jump in, research every appraisal you did for the last month to call up and complain. And that's really frustrating. And, and somebody said uh, earlier that they just ignore it. And I've been just ignoring it. But boy, it would be nice to get a, hey, you're doing great. Your status is unchanged, everything's good, and we can fire and forget and just move on to the next month. I can see how that would cause a lot of anxiety, you know, not knowing. Can, can I ask, are we, um, I would get numbers of revisions and then they would accumulate. And I got a call one time about the number of revisions on, a, you know, set number of, I mean, it weren't a lot, but. I wasn't aware at the time that I was supposed to, you know, pen an email and kind of explain it to, you know, the revisions appraiser relation department. Uh, are we still asking people to do that? To kind of follow up on revision by emailing in what had happened so that there's a note in the profile or are they supposed to call or what's the direction? I'll, I'll defer to, to Cindy, but my understanding is that if, if there is a discrepancy with your scorecard and you want to make sure that, that we have seen it and that we understand uh, that we do welcome the feedback. But Cindy, uh, can you provide any more details on that? Sure, Mike, you're, you're correct. You can definitely um, let us know about those things and we will notate them um, in, in your file. Um, first, I will say that, you know, it, we so much appreciate that you all really care. You care about your score and you care about work product and you care about our industry and, and, and what you do as an appraiser. That I think that means more than anything, but we're definitely hearing you. And again, just if you can please just be patient because we really are focused on this and improvements um, in this area. And and to take just one step back, and even when we can establish what our core kind of rules are within our class intelligence model, then we will be sharing that, like outwardly sharing that with you and providing you, you know, training documents, which is Julie's 
Julie's saying, um, but we want to put that, we want to put kind of the keys to the castle in your hands. So you will, then we'll be communicating the, you know, on the same level and you'll know what we're expecting and, and vice versa. So we, we're trying really hard. So please hang in there with us. And again, we so appreciate the fact that you care about this. I've had some appraiser or uh, some reviewers come back and say, sorry for the oversight. I'll go ahead and notate your profile so that you don't get knocked for that. Um, is that something that they can do so that I don't take the time to do it on myself, but is that something the reviewers can do for now? They sure can. Absolutely. Yep. Um, perhaps, Julie, if I can give an example of a, a revision like that that came in with me. Um, I had a revision come back. It was from a lender and they specifically said um, that their client had saw the report and said, that they had four bedrooms. Well, in the report, I had listed the three bedrooms that was on the first floor, and then they had a basement bedroom that was on a separate line, and it's all put together in the basement. And there, it was just a, they just didn't understand how to read the report. And that came back to me as a, as, as a revision, and I needed to, you know, say something and explain to them how we did it, and uh, then send it back. That was fine. But I'm wondering if there is a way to catch like a revision that's just an education. Like, how do you like, because normally it comes from the owner reading the report and suddenly saying, hey, something's wrong here, when really it's just been accounted for in a way that they may not have been expecting. I like that idea a lot. John, did you have something there? Yeah, I mean, we're talking about class intelligence again. It's our own QC platform that rivals others and the bonus is it's ours, right? So we have a whole development team that works on it very closely with Cindy, um, our, our data team as well. Um, one of the ways that we're going to be tackling that, Gillen, is by putting conditions in, into buckets. And so underwriting oversight is one of those buckets, right? So did the underwriter miss something? When we then can accumulate that data, we can take that back to a client and we can say, look, you, you've asked for this you know, 300 times this past month. What are we doing? What do you really want? Because if there's something you want and need, we can better articulate to, that to the appraiser up front so they're addressing it so you don't have to ask the question anymore. But if you don't need this, let's stop asking the appraisers. Is there anything that I can put, John, in my report that helps your system flag something? Like I got, I got a revision. It was actually just two days ago, and all the revisions said was um, the uh, that it has an accessory unit, and I, I it, the the subject did have an accessory unit. I did have an adjustment in there of how it was valued, and I had a big paragraph about how I was dealing with it. And I just, um, I didn't know what, I, what, the, what the revision was. And so I was trying to, to understand what can I put into my, my paragraph or my blurb that I'm trying to explain a particular point that's going to allow your algorithm or whatever to, to tone in on it and say, okay, this is, this is for this item. So Gillen, the, the great thing is, I think Mike, you mentioned it before, we have an ARC line. So those are appraisers. I mean, 10% of our workforce are appraisers, um, which is, I don't know how many AMCs can say that. Maybe Julie or Cindy think that's a big number or a small number. Um, but then on the ARC team, that's all appraisers. They're all on the QC floor um, and they're there to help you. And so if our QC team is missing something and you call the ARC line and, and somebody like me takes the call and says, Gillen, I understand completely what you're saying. Maybe they can re re review the commentary with you and come up with another solution, or they can then take it to the leadership on the QC floor and use that as a coaching moment for the team as a whole. I'm writing articles for the QC team all the time. Um, like, hey, you guys, this is a, a situation appraisers have to deal with. This is how they address it. Um, you know, let it go or, or ask for this. Does that make sense? <laughs> so before we move on to the next topic, I did want to look in the chat window here because I had a, a few different comments that I wanted to bring up. Um, let's see. Lamar, you had an easier, easy one. Um, Revision request three to four weeks after the report has been submitted. Is that a different lender causing this? And so 
I would say same lender. It's just it's gotten on an underwriter's desk and they're they're picking it apart now. Uh, and and that's the thing that stinks is that um, a lot of times that after it passes through us, then it sits somewhere else. And then, it, you know, and then you have to pick it up, you know, say you know, a month later. That's definitely frustrating. Um, Donald, you said uh, on a 1025, you were recently asked to check both the owner and the tenant box, um, but had to explain because XML does not allow for two boxes to be checked. It's very odd. Um, Danny, many times realtors don't understand that and unfortunately err on the side of buy, buy or seller. So that's in response to, to you, Gillen, about the basement being, or the, the bedroom being counted in the basement. Um, okay. Daniel, I'll, yours is gonna be the last one that I take before we move on. Regarding the scorecards, just wondering if scorecards are correlated uh, to geographic area. So that's a really good point. I'm gonna spin that over to Cindy because there have been changes um, to the way that, that we, um, I don't wanna say grade, but look at performance and look at the metrics. Uh, and that is part of the whole class act um, change as well. So I'll, I'll go over to Cindy on that. Yes, we, we are definitely looking at, um, we're at the county level right now. So we're looking at, when we're looking at Class Act, we're looking at the top 20% of performance within that county. And some of you might work in multiple counties. So we're working on kind of a formula for that as well. And we're gonna base that primarily on the number of orders you've performed in, in each of those counties. Um, but I think that's really, really important because if you're in a rural market or, you know, something, some type of unusual market, it's really not fair to compare you um, or your score somewhere else. Just like the, C, the you know, kind of CU scores that, that we see or hear about that vary based on complexity and things like that. So um, we are definitely moving that direction in, overall for scoring, for scorecards and for um, our class act panel. I think that's a really good point because before we were we were judging kind of like on a nationwide level. And so now it's what's happening in your market and what's different. And to Cindy's point about CU, like I can't, I used to work at Fannie, so I can't tell you how many high CU scores came over. It was a good report. Um, and CU is based off of uh, not complexity necessarily, but risk factor. And so it just means that, that it's pointing someone's attention to like a higher score. Someone should take a closer look at that. That doesn't mean the report is deficient. And so we want to make sure um, that our appraisers are, are being judged based on what's actually happening in their market. All right. Um, we've gotten through two really good meaty questions. So let's move on to the next. Um, I, think, I think Pete had a question. Oh, yep. Sorry, Pete. I didn't see you. Uh, I didn't have a question, but I have a comment on um, one of the one of our uh, viewers. Uh, they were saying that on the 1025 that that you can't check the owner in the tenant box because it creates an XML problem. I don't I'm not sure that that's correct. I know you can check both the boxes and, and the 1025 is not a UAD compliant form. And so I don't know. Uh, I it is appropriate to check both boxes and I don't think it creates an XML issue because you don't get XML errors. You only get UAD errors, but the 1025 is not a UAD form. So I wasn't quite sure what his question was there. And yes, you can check both the owner and the tenant box. Pete, it's, I, I'll, I'll take it real quick. So each software treats it differently. It's not that it won't allow you to, it may create a stop. And so if you're having that happen, I would reach out to your software provider and figure out what the workaround is for that. Okay, yeah, because yeah, it doesn't, it's not an issue with all the mode creating the XML for sure. Thanks, that was it. Thank you, let's see. All right, the next topic I had was late night revisions. Uh, and this is really just more of a question that I think the class team can knock out pretty quickly and then we can move on to the next. Uh, the question was, does this count against the appraiser if not addressed in the four hour window? Um, and then is it calculated by actual hours or business hours or time zones considered? So uh, Cindy or, or John, I'll let you take that. That would be business hours and time zones would, would be included in that. Perfect. That was an easy one to knock out. Um, okay. Like <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, okay, 
recent increase in revision requests for compliance or other checklist items. Um, so this was basically an observation that an appraiser had made that they're, they're getting more revisions now um, and, and kind of wanted some clarity there. So uh, I think class can take that one as well. Um, I, I'm sure Cindy will jump in too. I, I think there's a couple of things that are happening. Statistically speaking, I can tell you it's actually not true. I don't have the statistics in front, but it might feel like it from time to time. Um, we are getting better at some questions. And to be fair, our client list, as many of you know, who've been working with us for a while, it's expanding. It's expanding quite a bit, um, which is great for us. And it means you're doing a great job working with us. And we appreciate that. With new clients though, come new requirements or higher expectations. And so we have these same kind of calls with our clients and I can assure you, oftentimes it's the client saying, hey, how come you're not catching this anymore? And then it becomes a highlighted review item for the QC team. Cindy, did you have anything else you wanted to add to that? Sure, I, I will tag on with our class intelligence we're actually doing a lot of modeling around which rules fail and how often and you know, are, how do they correlate to what the clients might come back for so we can line up there. So in essence, as we continue to go through this modeling, we should be able to make your lives better. And again, when we fine tune what all of those rules and logic looks like, we will share it with you. It's not, it's not a black box on our side. We'll be fully transparent with what that looks like so we can all be on the same page. Like for instance, if you get a revision back and you're like, what does this mean? Or if it's not making sense to you, we wanna speak in, the, in a language that makes sense to you when you receive these things back. So we'll take feedback in, in all of those areas as well as we continue to refine. Thanks. Now here's one that I can direct to all of the panelists. What are some of your common recurring revisions that just Nails on a chalkboard that, that great you. We're all going to jump in on this one. <laughs> I, Not I all to, at once. <laughs> I have to say, though, honestly, of all the AMCs I deal with, class sends me the least amount of revisions. And uh, there was a point a few months back where I was pulling my hair out and having knowing people that work at class, I was laboring them with phone calls about reoccurring revisions for you know, adding below grade sketches on uh, non FHA appraisals, or, you know, I have a paragraph that I've used forever for public or, you know, well water. Uh, and because it didn't have the word public in it, I don't think the reviewers were catching it. And so I was getting this back on every report that had a well water system in it. And, uh, but I, that's gone away. I mean, it's been a month or two and I, I haven't had that revision one time. So, I mean, I, I gotta give you guys credit. Um, I don't think I've had a revision in two months, so. Can you tell everybody what you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, putting, I'm putting every catch word in the paragraph that you can imagine. Every, every I think word. I hate you now. <laughs> I think I hate you now. <laughs> Anybody else have some common recurrent revisions? One of the things you talked about on when we were doing the review call <clears throat> is if you're getting multiple revisions for the same thing over and over, considering redoing the wording in your addendum, like what John was saying about certain words may not be getting picked up. And he was just talking about not having well water or the certain word put in there. Maybe you can revise your addendum to include that keyword that they're looking for. So when they go to do the word search, it's there. You know, or if you see a common recurrence, find out exactly what they're looking for. If you're getting the same thing more than once and the wording's in there, it's in your addendum call them and say, what are you specifically looking for? And if they tell your keyword, just amend your addendum to include that keyword. And that should end that. Yeah. Good point. Maybe this is a good time for your famous quote of working on your report or in your report or whatever you had. <laughs> Clean up your addendum language. Are you talking about what I said, Pete? Yeah, right. We're, we're, it, it's really, it's a basis based off of the e-myth principle um, where entrepreneurs typically work in their business, not on it. And so use the, apply the same thing to reports. And, um, you know, uh, I have a very good friend that does a lot of litigation and sometimes as appraisers and Mike likes my term inattentional blindness, not my term, it's a real word, but, um, and his primary focus was litigation. 
And sometimes we think we know what we said and it sounded really great. And there was one case he admits the judge, the, the uh, opposing attorney said, read what he wrote in a report, asked him what he meant. He asked him to repeat himself. And he literally turned to the judge and said, I thought it sounded good when I wrote it. I'm going to be honest. I don't know what I'm saying there. You know, it happens. Um, so to Kathy's point, I try to focus as an appraiser on what my clients are looking for. And maybe it sounds great to me and I know what it means, but they don't. So if I can figure out what it is that they're looking for, what they think it means and what they, then I can adjust my reports that way, so. Josh, I just noticed that you raised your hand. Yeah, I'm not sure if this is the right spot to put this in, but I did copy a condition that I got and it came over as the report does not contain the required comparable photos or MLS photos have been used. And the only thing that would make my life as an appraiser easier on any revision is if they specifically tell me it was comp number three, comp number five. Um, same thing with title or, or legal description when they say, please include the legal description from title. You know, give me the lot plot black. I mean, you're they're looking at it copy it, paste it, and then also include the preliminary. So that way I can just copy theirs, put it in my report. And it's one of those time is money kind of things. If I don't have to scroll through my report and find it, I would just love to have the data that you have presented to me on a silver platter. And then I can just update my report and we can all move on. And class is great. I don't get very many revision requests and almost most of them are pertinent. There is one I got, I sent it to John, but uh, hopefully it's a training one. <laughs> hopefully so I didn't screw that's up. That's a good point though. <laughs> like being, for us to be a little more specific, like you said, and, and be able to like, if we know that there's a discrepancy, then show you where it is, right? Right, so I can just go right there and fix it and get it to you right away would save a lot of time, I agree. Can I chime in on that too? Because when there's an owner of record or legal description variance, they'll send you a 25 page abstract and tell you to make it match. And then you literally read it for 20 minutes to find where the stuff is used. So that would be a very important and helpful thing. Agreed, <laughs> that's a good point. I think I've so got... too. And that was even one of the questions too about uh, matching title work too. Uh, somebody else had a, a point though. Yeah, I got this one for John. John, maybe you can answer this for me, but I uh, hate the dreaded uh, predominant value uh, revision request. Uh, whereas why, you know, the subject's value is below the predominant value for the area. And, you know, I mean, as far as I know, there's no such thing as predominant value. It's just what's in the report. But, you know, I have, I have statements in there that says basically the subject, you know, falls within the high to low range within the neighborhood. Um, and you know and whatever else but sometimes that gets turned back to me but i hate that predominant value one so please give me some insight on how to just cut that out permanently uh mark the best way to cut that out is i've been trying with clients for probably seven years now on reading the report and using logic in regard to that but i can tell you julie i don't know there's I'm getting a lot of feedback um, I'll ask the panelists to mute, please. I'll mute where I can. So, um, thank you. That's better. Um, what I can say is this, it is almost on every engagement letter, we're using logic around it for client specific. Every client is so concerned with some sort of comment and they have a different percentage I prefer industry standard of 20, but believe it or not, we have some clients that are like if it's 15, if it's 10, or if it's just different. Um, and it, I agree, Mark, it drives me crazy. But what I do in my report is I have a standard comment and I fill in the blank. I leave an XXXX in there so I can do a word search. And then I say it's below or it's above and call it a day. I like that. Any other predominant questions or I got tricked with the word predominant recurring questions is what I wanted to say. I have a statement that I put in every report. I've never had that condition come back where basically like John said, you're putting in that it's above or below the predominant, but then I add a little blurb in there that it's not considered a super adequacy because it hasn't exceeded the high end of the range. So maybe just tailor that paragraph to show that yes, it's above or below, 
but it's it's expected and give the parameters of the above and below. Agreed. All right. Are y'all ready to move on to the next topic? We're good here. Um, this is this probably touches on another one that we did, but um, appraisers are reporting it's frustrating to address revisions that are minor in nature that have no impact on value or property eligibility. Anybody have experience with that? Lately, um, a couple times, luckily not too recurring, but two or three times in the past couple of weeks, I've been asked to blur a license plate of a car. Okay. <laughs> so I hadn't heard that one before, but it's probably come over, I think, at least two or three times. So now I'm just trying to watch it. But. Yeah. It's ironic, right? Because if you think about it from a fair housing perspective and then just from compliance and confidentiality and all of that kind of stuff, right? Like, um, it's interesting because FHA, for example, if you're talking about that particular group or investor, they don't care if anybody's in photos, they don't care what's in the photo. It is the actual mortgagee though that does care, right? And so if you got somebody asking you to blur out a license plate, Jocelyn, that has to be coming from the lender because we wouldn't care. I wouldn't think so. <laughs> Anyone else on that? All right, let's see. Okay, kind of along those lines, this is a good lead in, MLS photo revisions. So Kathy, I know that you had this one. I think Jocelyn, you had this too when we went over our, our dry run. Um, so if there are children, oh, Gillen, you had it too. Uh, if there are children present, you're near a school, you're not gonna take photos. They're like a creep on the street. And so you're putting in MLS photos and you're making comment about it. Um, and so you've gotten some revisions around that. Anybody wanna expand on that? I know I had even gotten a response from HUD about that. And I said, well, when there's people out front, what would you suggest that we do? And he did say something that makes sense. They just want to verify that in some way, shape or form that you saw the exterior of the comparable that you're looking at. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the house picture. It's kind of like how you would treat it if you went to a community in which it was gated. You take a picture of the gate and provide the picture of the MLS. So if you go to a house and you can't take the picture for whatever reason, somebody's out, safety reasons, children, take something else that verifies you were there. For example, a street sign, something like that. So you can say, see, I was on Washington Street. I just didn't give you a picture of that house for X amount of reasons and include that with the MLS picture as well. Good point. Anyone else? That was a quick one. I, I'll, I'll just add this, Julie. Uh -huh. So great, great advice, Kathy. There's all kinds of things we can do, right? So the curb number, the mailbox, the, the house next door, and then put an arrow pointing to the comp, right? With the side of the, a street sign, the whatever's obstructing your view. Um, I have had numerous conversations with the Hawk Chiefs and policy in DC. They, this is their policy. They're not gonna change it back down from it, even though Fannie and Freddie have if you want it changed, their suggestion is to write Congress. So it's not our policy, it's theirs. Um, I hate to tell you that, but um, and Josh, you worked in the, the FHA field, so you, you understand. But um, anyways, thank you for the advice though, Kathy. That's great stuff. All right. We're actually getting pretty, uh, pretty far down the list. Um, we're on question number eight and we got 10 minutes left. Um, Water heater straps and CO detector photos, understanding state and local requirements around that. So Gillen, I think this is one that you brought up during our dry run uh, that you're getting a lot of revision requests about uh, when you've actually made some commentary. Yeah, and what I was running into was that in the state of Utah, there's a number of different seismic zones. So some of it on the Wasatch Front I mean, everyone has to have the double straps, but you go further down towards Moab and it's all bedrock, they don't. And so I, I just found that um, that insight wasn't um, 
I guess as detailed. So it was just almost just like, is it Utah or is it, do I see straps in the picture? And it was automatically being sent back to me. Uh, when, you know, I had actually in, in sometimes gone back and forth and, and gotten a hold of the uh, building inspector and they had quoted me all of the things and said, no, 100%, that house is fine. Probably a takeaway for us, John, uh, there. Are there any suggestions that we would have on this side where it may kind of quell a revision? So that doesn't get sent like any additional commentary in the agenda? To be fair, we should only be asking the question for California, Washington, Oregon. Um, so those are the states where it's statewide mandate. Um, and those are the only states that the water heater is even referenced in our engagement letters. So if you're, Gillen, you're receiving a Utah specific uh, state state specific engagement letter from us, it doesn't even reference water heaters in there, but it does for Josh and, and Jeff in California. And so CO detectors, I would encourage you just to go to something like First Alert has a legislation map. That's great for knowing what's required. Oh, it's actually required a new construction built after 2009. Okay, well, purchases, new construction, the house is built in 1973 and it's a refi. Well, I guess it's not required, right? Um, lenders sometimes continue to push the team um, and they'll continue to push the team for a response, even though we're pushing back, to be fair. But um, it should only be those three states from us. So uh, I'll look into that, Gillen, for Utah. Yeah, it's a possible training item for us, for sure. All right. Sales contract revisions. Um, so I guess, so after the appraiser has submitted their report, then there's been a revision to the sales contract. We see this a lot on purchases, obviously. Well, duh, only on purchases, but in cases where your value was lower than the purchase price, so then they're gonna revise the, the purchase price and redo the contract. And so we've seen those come through as well. Any additional thoughts on that? Me or the panel? I, oh, sorry. <laughs> I was gonna say, I was gonna say, I talked to John about this after the last meeting, and he clarified that that was gonna be a training thing about putting it in the addendum, not and not requesting it on page one. So that was just something on the clear uh, training on on his side. He was gonna do. So to to for full transparency, so Captain, thank you for reminding me that. So number one, I would tell you this, Fanny, Freddie. They have a statement in their selling guides that say, we don't need this, right? Um, Julie knows I stood right with a client and right with one of her counterparts when she was at Fannie and the lender said, I don't care that you don't want it. I want it. Okay, fair enough. HUD has no policy statement on it, but they don't expect the report to change if something occurred after the effective date. So they actually don't want it either. USPAP has uh, addressed this. There's a way to do it. The appropriate way is in the uh, is in the addendum. So Kathy, after you and I spoke, I found out which lender was really driving page one, and I addressed it with their credit risk department. And so that should stop. So full transparency, that feedback that I got from Catherine or any of you helps me go back to a client. And I appreciate that. I think that's a really good takeaway for all of us is if, if you've got something that is really grinding you or it's happening a lot or it doesn't seem right, we're here <laughs> to, to take that feedback. Um, I put out my email address pretty regularly. It's jjones at classvaluation.com. There's also the appraiser outreach box, appraiser outreach at classvaluation.com. Uh, John, what's your preferred method? Oh, uh, <laughs> everyone can reach me. My email is jdingaman at classvaluation.com. If you're emailing me, sorry. You, you get, <laughs> somehow you get my cell number on all of my communications as well. I, but look, I, I'm pretty open to all of you. For those of you that know me, you know you can call me most any time of the day or week and I'll answer the phone. I just do. Um, I care very much about our profession. I care very much about each one of you. I'm probably, if you know, you think coach, you know, we'd say a, a, a player's coach or whatever, I'm probably an appraiser's chief appraiser. Um, I'm taking up your position 
uh, probably unfairly sometimes to a client because I'm going to defend the appraiser first. Um, but just reach me, call me, do whatever it is you want to do that you feel comfortable with, and I'll help. It's a good point. I mean, that's really what this forum is about, right, is, is to get the feedback where we may not have otherwise gotten it. Um, again, you're always welcome to email appraiser outreach um, at classvaluation.com. And uh, so me um, or Dory on my team will distribute where that, that needs to go and, and give the feedback. Um, let's see. I think we actually already covered this last question that I had in another one, but this was um, uh, pushing appraisers to change the owner of public record to match the title work. And so um, I think it was you, Josh, that had pointed out, like, if you want me to match the title work, tell me what's on the title work. <laughs> Anybody else have that happen or any additional thoughts on that topic? This is kind of a pet peeve for me is that um, it, this seems like the simplest part of the appraisal process is just reporting who's on public record. I'm not in a position to run a title search. It's not in my scope of work. I'm going to the public record data source. I'm supplying you copies of it. This is what it says. If they're lax in updating their system or if the deed wasn't filed, that's on everybody else. And that seems like that would be an underwriting situation that they could rectify outside of the appraisal process. And I know that John is on this, but I, in the past and with all AMCs, if it doesn't look right, they're gonna send it right back to the appraiser and try to rectify it by having the appraiser put themselves out on the limb to say that a different person owns that property and I just won't do it. But you guys are very cognizant of that and I know that everybody's working on making sure that doesn't happen, but that is a pet peeve. I would just add that is that's a it's a big one, Mike. So thank you. And what I would say is this: I've done two things. I wish I could share with you the flow chart, but I gave the team that handles underwriting conditions from our clients a flow chart on a bunch of different items. And owner of public record is one of them. And it says two things, right? Number one, just go to the appraisal report. Do they have a copy of the property records card in the report? I included one in every report I've ever done. That's helpful because number one, it just tells you go look at the property records card. That's where I got my information. So I'm not changing it from there. The second thing I did is when clients are saying match the title work, Mike, you said it spot on. It, the title or the prelim from the title company is not the public records, right? A reviewer, a reader of the report needs to be able to find the, the property through the same means you did. And if I'm looking at somebody else or something different, or maybe it hasn't even recorded yet, right? So um, there are instructions on how to push back on the client at this point in that flow chart, so. All right, so we have three minutes left. I am actually shocked, but we've taken 10 questions. I was expecting a roughly half of that. Um, so I'm glad that we got all of those covered. I think it's a lot of good content. I'm gonna look in our chat window here to see if I've got anything else, like any additional questions. And I don't think I do uh, other than what's already been covered. Um, panelists, anything else that, that we didn't go over before that maybe popped up that you wanna add to? Um, I have a, a, just a quick uh, question. Mm -hmm. And um, so if a report sometimes, um, comes in below the contract price. Do those reports, even when that happens, I review my report more carefully because in the back of my mind, I think, well, if this is gonna torpedo a deal, everyone's gonna be looking at this. And yep. so does that go through a different review process than a traditional report? Or, I mean, or, or does it just go through the same thing? John, I'll let you take that. It, it really goes through the same process, right? We're trusting you as our valued partner and our, our the appraiser who's putting their signature on the line. And so we know, I know, um, but we know as an organization, it's very hard for an appraiser. I mean, none of us want to report bad news. So um, you've done your very best to get you there. Um, it usually will not come to the surface unless it's number one, it's really off. And there's no commentary at all. And it might get escalated to our QC escalations team and appraiser just kind of look through it and see if it makes sense. Um, or it ends up going to the client and then they're going to ask questions and those will get filtered through the QC escalations team as well, generally speaking. Thank you for that. 
one minute left. Cindy had to drop. She says that she's so sorry she had another call. Um, I did have a suggestion from David Payne. David, by the way, good to see your name there. Um, he said it would be great to have the title company and title reference number included with the order. That's a, a good point. That's a good idea. I think that's, that's something that we could possibly take back uh, to think on. Um, but I'm going to leave it there. We covered a lot of ground today. I appreciate everybody's participation. Uh, class team, thank you very much. And then also my panelists, like you took an hour out of your day to like, well, actually you took two hours because you helped me prep. Uh, and then you did this. So this is, this is much appreciated. And then for the attendees as well, everybody took at least an hour to two hours of their time to join this. Um, this is going to be really great feedback. We're going to share it with the entire panel. So hopefully a lot of people get something out of it. Uh, we're going to take your suggestions back to our team to see if there's anything that we can either implement um, in class intelligence, uh, our automated uh, system or platform, or is there a training that we can take back to our, our own team? Is there ways that we can communicate better? So this has been really helpful for me and I, I really appreciate everybody that's joined. Uh, with that, I will leave you and wish you a good rest of your week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.